500. In the 1960s, in the developing world, life expectancy was about 60% of what it was in the, in the developed world. It's now about 80%. Caloric intake is up in the develop, developing world by about a third, and so on and on and on. No one knows anything about this. Hardly anyone knows anything about this. Now, these statistics I've just given you are based on sources that are easily consulted. Anybody can get them. And I'm basically drawing them from the World Bank and similar sources, so I'm not getting them from the Tom Woods Sinister Free Market Statistical Forum. I mean, these are, anybody can find these, they're just sitting there. But nobody knows, I mean, you'd think we should be congratulating everybody on this and, and, and appreciating the system that makes this possible. Because up till recently, nobody thought this was possible. Up until relatively recently, it never occurred to anybody that they should go out and protest poverty. Could you imagine somebody in the year 1250 protesting poverty? I mean, how utterly pointless that would be? Protesting poverty in the year 1250. I mean, why would that be pointless? Because at that time, that state of the economy in the world, the economy is so physically unproductive that you can protest all you want. Even if everybody worked 120 hours a week, you couldn't lift everybody out of poverty. The economy couldn't produce enough stuff to satisfy everybody's needs. So it, it seemed to people that this is just simply a fact of life that can never be eradicated and you're just going to have to live with it. You're going you're gonna to be born into filth and squalor. You're going to live your miserable life one bad harvest away from starvation, and then you're going to die, and that's life. That's why people aren't protesting poverty in 1250, not because they were all rich living in castles, because they thought, what's the point? It's like protesting against gravity. I'm sick and tired of falling off this cliff. Let me have a candlelight vigil or a hunger strike against that. What would the point be? So what I want to ask now is, before getting into our current situation, was it just a coincidence then that at a time when the world has moved more and more toward a free market sort of economy, now not as fast as it might, not as systematically as it might, but clearly, I mean, no one would dispute that's the direction that we've seen the world moving in. Maybe it's just a coincidence that that happened and we see this alleviation of poverty. Maybe it's a coincidence. But I don't think it is a coincidence. I think we can demonstrate just through reason that it's not. There's a logic to this process, and the logic basically works like this. Try and imagine for a minute what it would be like if in our economy, all the machines that we use to produce things suddenly disappeared. Some Martians took them away. We have no more assembly lines, no more capital goods, no more machinery to produce. If you want to produce something, you've got to produce it with your bare hands. And communication, forget it. Cell phones, that out. Uh, we'll let you I'll let you have the telegraph. I'll be a sport about it. You have the telegraph and your bare hands. And now you've got to try and produce things. Well, I think we can all see. If we're trying to produce things with just a lousy telegraph to communicate to each other, and the only thing we'd use the telegraph for is to talk about how crummy our lives are at this point. You've got the telegraph and your bare hands. How much are you going to be able to produce? Well, a tiny, tiny fraction of what you used to be able to produce, right? And in fact, there will be some classes of goods you can't produce at all with your bare hands. I mean, try producing, you know, a 2010 Hyundai Sonata with your bare hands from the beginning of that production process to the finished car. Good luck. Plasma TV, bare hands. Go ahead and see how that goes. So in other words, we'll be living in such a poor economy, we won't know what to do with ourselves. So let's say we keep working 40 hours a week in this economy. Or you know what? How about this? We get really ambitious and we say, look, we've got to really buckle down here, folks. You know, things are grim. We'll double our working hours. We'll work 80 hours a week. We would still be producing a tiny, tiny pittance of what we used to produce before. So in that economy, why would we be poor? Why would it be that each person, that per capita in that economy, you would have relatively few goods, relatively little furniture, relatively little food, uh, relatively little clothing? Why would there be little of this for each person? Would it be because wicked exploiters were wickedly depriving everyone of these things? No, obviously because we can't produce these things. We can't produce them in the quantities that we want. And so even if we say that one in a thousand people in this society is a rich capitalist, all right, let's say we just redistribute his wealth. That'll solve the problem. Okay, so we take his greater than average consumption, we divide it by 999 and we redistribute it. What's that going to do for people in this society? Oh, great. Everybody gets one one hundredth of a table leg. Wow, it's fantastic. My life is, will never be the same. Obviously, that can't do the trick. 
But that's sort of what, what is it usually implied, that, oh, it's because the rich people were just keeping all the stuff to themselves. If only we could have grabbed it from them. But people who say that have no idea. They're much too optimistic. They have no idea the extent of the poverty that existed in those days. Wouldn't have done a thing for anybody. Wouldn't have even been noticeable. One thing it would have done is made darn sure that guy stopped producing. If you're going to take all my stuff, I guess I'll just leave. Or I'll, you know, whatever, I'll just I'll do something else. I'll drink wine all day or something, but I certainly won't work for you people. So think about this then. How do people, how would we get out of that situation? How would we get out of an economy like that? Well, of course, we want the, let's say we can't chase after the Martians and get our machines back. We know that the machines are the solution to the problem. And the machines are the solution simply because they make the production process more physically productive. They make it possible for us to produce things in much greater abundance than we could before. And because we can produce in greater abundance, we don't need to work as hard. Because the machines, in effect, do a lot of the labor that we used to have to do with our bare hands. And so this becomes the solution. How do we get these machines back? Well, the answer is by saving and investing, by not blowing your whole paycheck, but saving some of that. And entrepreneurs take that savings and they invest it to buy machines, to mechanize the production process so that we can produce more goods. The greater abundance of goods then puts, puts downward pressure on prices so that when you get your paycheck, you can go out into the economy and command more goods. That is the process by which our living standards have improved. Not by looting other people, that just, obviously that just disrupts this process. But no, simply by allowing this function to work, the investment in machinery and capital equipment that creates more physical productivity, that creates more goods, that puts downward pressure on the prices of those goods in terms of how long it takes to earn the money necessary to buy them, and therefore we see our living standards rise. Well, that's what the market makes possible. It's a free market economy that says we're not going to tax this process. We're not crazy. Why would we want to tax the process by which everybody becomes wealthier? Why would we want to tax the process by which people can command per capita more goods? I mean, we, that would be insane. Of course we don't want to do that. So in a market economy, this, this process can continue unhampered. And generation after generation, you see an explosion and a continual rise in the standard of living. So it is not a coincidence that we have seen these phenomena. So this is why. Just in a nutshell, we look at these sort of virtues, totally overlooked virtues of the free market. This is why it is that some of us come to the rescue of the market when it is unjustly uh, maligned and blamed for things that it is not responsible for. Because we're afraid that if we misdiagnose an economic crisis such as the one that we continue to live through, that we're going to, I hate to say throw the baby out with the bathwater, but we're going to dispense with the social system that in spite of all the monopoly caricatures, has done more for mankind's standard of living than any other that has ever existed. And so, yeah, we are going to be a little careful before we assign all the blame to this institution. Now, tonight in particular, I'm focusing on a particular branch of economic thought that's known as the Austrian School of Economic Thought. It has nothing whatsoever to do today with the country of Austria. It has to do with the fact that a lot of the early practitioners of this school of thought hailed from Austria. Now today, the Austrian school is probably the smallest existing school of economic thought in the world, but it's also the fastest growing. And it, it also happens to be the oldest continuously existing school of economic thought in the world, and it's had its ups and downs. But right now, it's on a big up trajectory. And the reason for that is this, that when this economic crisis really hit us around 2007, 2008, it took the world by surprise, and particularly the economics world by surprise. Hardly anyone saw this coming. Even James Galbraith said in the New York Times, he said there were probably 15,000 professional economists in the country. I think that's a, a, an underestimate, big underestimate, by the way. But nevertheless, he says of that 15,000, maybe a dozen predicted this crisis. Hmm. Well, maybe a dozen of the people James Galbraith has cocktails with predicted the crisis. But I mean, I can just name 12 people off the top of my head from the Austrian school who predicted this. But it is the function of the gatekeepers of opinion in our society to make sure that unorthodox points of view just don't get expressed. We don't hear about the Austrian School of Economics. We don't hear that these people predicted this because these people are, are, are unpersons. These people aren't really there. In fact, they are there. And thanks to YouTube, you can, you can see them too. That's right. I know this is exciting. Go home and watch Economists on your computer screen. <laughs> oh, yeah, you guys, you're warming my heart here. Warming my heart. But in particular, a lot of you people know this guy, Peter Schiff. Now, Peter Schiff 
It's, you know, it's easy for us now in 2010 to say, man, what a housing bubble we had going. Housing prices were just crazy, right? All you have to do is tune into HGTV to see that people at that time did not think it was crazy at all. I mean, you watch some of those shows and they're going, well, let's see, I mean, it's, let's see, it doesn't have a gazebo and it's only 5,500 square feet and, gee, I was hoping that we could, like, what? Like, what is, has the whole world gone completely insane? But Peter Schiff says to a convention of mortgage brokers, this whole thing is a house of cards. This is going to come crashing down. You people are living in a fantasy world. And I'm going to tell you exactly how this is going to happen. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are going to go bust. And people laughed. In fact, people literally laughed at Peter Schiff. I'm sure some of you have seen the video, Peter Schiff was right. And, sure, and almost two million people have viewed this video now. And here's Peter Schiff. He does get some TV time. But they put him up against, you know, he's always against three people who are, who are trying to drown him out. And in each segment, this is just a, a compilation on YouTube of various cable news programs that Schiff was on. And it shows him going toe-to-toe -to -toe with these opponents. And he's, he's warning, no, 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 this, the crash is coming. And here's why. Here's why. Because I'm going to show later. It's not that Peter Schiff, you know, uh, was using tea leaves or... He reads tarot cards, and he woke up that day, and he flipped over, and the death card was there, and he went on TV and said, oh, everybody, wait. It's that he had the intellectual apparatus to understand what was going on fundamentally in the economy. Well, there's a segment in there in which people are actually laughing at him. Oh, Peter Schiff. Oh, man, when are you going to learn? Everybody, listen, go out and buy stocks like crazy. Go out and buy Merrill Lynch, people are saying. Okay. How many people apologized to Peter Schiff, by the way? The answer is not zero, which is the usual answer. The answer is one, actually, the actor Ben Stein. So to his credit, Ben Stein said, look, Peter Schiff was nailed it, he was right, and I was dead wrong. Okay, but the rest of them, they're acting like this never occurred. They're still giving advice, blah, 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 without saying, by the way, I realize that I've been dead wrong, so maybe you should give me a year, like, to cool off before you listen to me again. Yeah, nothing like that. So people began to say, well, gee, who is this? Peter Schiff guy. And it turns out Schiff is a student of the Austrian School of Economics. So what is it about this School of Economics? Or we have Ron Paul, a, a congressman who will say unfashionable things, and people will say, oh, there's that kooky old Ron Paul. I mean, what's he talking about the Federal Reserve for? Why only a crank would talk about this subject? We all know that the fundamentals of the economy are sound, blah, 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 blah. The talking heads give us that. And then the crash comes, and people say, well, gee, Ron Paul, how did you describe this phenomenon to a T? Like, I mean, we just kind of want to know how did you know it? And once again, Ron Paul talks about Austrian economics, Austrian economics. So this has become an interest that people have now. In fact, it's gotten to the point where I know this has not permeated economics departments, which are always the last to sort of get on the bandwagon. <laughs> But it has permeated the financial world, I'll tell you that. I'd love to see some of these professors go to some of these financial conferences. Uh, because if you ask a lot of financial analysts today, they'll say, of course I know the Austrian theory of the business cycle. I'm not an idiot. I mean, I, you know, I've been reading what's been going on. I've been reading Peter Schiff. I've been reading uh, some of these old Austrian economists because they actually seem to understand what's going on. So now it's not like some weird crankish thing that a few people off in the corner seem to know about. But this is becoming fast becoming a mainstream phenomenon, partly because we have YouTube which allows us, again, to get around the New York Timeses of the world, who have been, the New York Times was so dead wrong about the crisis that I'll have to save that for a little later. That deserves a section of its own. But these are the people who want to tell us, now, wait a minute, people, don't get uppity. We're going to tell you the people you should listen to. In fact, some of you guys know this website, uh, news and opinion site, Slate. The, uh, the head of Slate, I think, I think he runs it, uh, Jacob Weisberg, I think he's, he's, he, he runs it. He had an article the other day saying, among other things, you know what really disturbs me about the state of public opinion right now is that some people are really urging their fellow Americans, in effect, to thumb their noses at the experts. <laughs> oh, I have no idea why. <laughs> Gee, where, where would that come from? I mean, I guess we forgot what our role in this society is. It's just to sit back and be told by Jacob Weisberg or the New York Times or Chris Matthews or Keith Olbermann or Bill O'Reilly or whatever. Just sit and be told which people we're supposed to listen to and what we're supposed to believe. Well, people are actually breaking out of this and saying, you know what, I did listen to those people and that's why I lost half my portfolio. So I'm a little curious to get another kind of point of view here.